Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the justice dilemma. Let's get to it. A recurring issue for international institutions geared toward justice is how best to deal with leaders who are guilty of atrocities or other crimes against humanity. Muammar Gaddafi is a prime example. As the head of state of Libya for a long time period, he was insulated from justice, despite having allegedly committed those types of crimes. However, there were a couple of major changes in 1998 in how the international community dealt with these sorts of issues. First is the signing of the Rome Statute, which is what paved the way for the International Criminal Court. This is an international institution that is explicitly interested in dealing with these sorts of issues. The other involved Augusto Pinochet, the former head of state of Chile. During his time in power, Pinochet allegedly made political opponents disappear and committed exactly the type of atrocity or crime against humanity that international courts are interested in prosecuting. In 1998, Pinochet traveled to the United Kingdom for a medical procedure. While there, he was arrested. The corresponding court proceedings generated an interesting precedent. A Spanish judge ruled that European states had the right to try Pinochet for crimes committed in Chile under a doctrine known as universal jurisdiction. The idea here is that some crimes are so wrong, things like mass atrocities or human rights violations or crimes against humanity that it doesn't matter where they are committed. Any leader who is culpable can be tried anywhere else in the world. Hence the name universal jurisdiction. This sent shockwaves through the international community. And I want to think a little bit harder about the incentive structure that it created. Imagine that you are a dictator and you are culpable for crimes against humanity that took place before 1998, before the advent of universal jurisdiction. Imagine then that a civil war broke out in your country. Are you more or less likely to give up power as a consequence of universal jurisdiction? Well, before universal jurisdiction started being exercised, you could go into exile. And if you've hidden enough money in a Swiss bank account, exile might look very attractive for you. You can have a very happy and healthy retirement just in a different country. Post universal jurisdiction, however, that option wasn't there. If you were to try to go into exile, it might just be a matter of time before another country comes and arrests you for crimes that you committed inside of the state that you once ruled. As a consequence, you have more incentive to fight hard and resist giving up power within a civil war precisely because your outcomes if you try to leave the country are so bad. Thus, the pursuit of justice might get in the way of increasing freedoms for repressed populations inside of dictatorships, at least those who have leaders who are culpable before 1998. Moreover, there is empirical evidence for exactly this effect. Leaders who are culpable for crimes before 1998 have become less inclined to give up power in the event of a crisis after 1998 than they were before 1998. In other words, universal jurisdiction has made those leaders clutch onto power even harder. Now let's switch gears. Let's still imagine that you're a dictator, but this time you are not culpable before 1998. That might be because you simply never got around to committing those crimes when you were in power during that pre-1998 period, or alternatively, you came into power after 1998. Does the advent of universal jurisdiction and Pinochet's arrest make you more or less inclined to commit atrocities? Well, certainly the first order consequence of universal jurisdiction is a deterrent effect. If I value going into exile and I want to keep my options open, Committing an atrocity is going to seal that shut. As a consequence, I should be less likely to commit those atrocities. 
and indeed we observe that empirically. For leaders who are not culpable before 1998, we see those leaders committing less atrocities than before this universal jurisdiction period began. But that might not be the full theoretical story. Take a look at this culpability game. A group of rebels must decide whether to concede an issue or stage a revolt. If they revolt, the leader chooses whether to fight or quietly go into exile. In this interaction, the rebels most prefer that the leader goes into exile. That guarantees that they will be successful and take over the government. In contrast, the rebels' worst outcome is for the leader to fight. One might think that that's because the rebels don't think that their odds are particularly good, and if they were to lose the fight, then the leader might kill them all. Conceding the issue is a middle outcome. It's not great for the rebels because the leader is staying in charge and perhaps those rebels are being repressed, but it's still better than dying in the fight. Meanwhile, the leader most prefers that the rebels concede. The leader gets to stay in power and also gets to implement the policy that the leader wanted to in the first place. Fighting for the leader isn't a great outcome. There's some chance that the leader will lose, war is costly regardless, and in the event that things go terribly wrong, it's possible that the leader will be killed. I've left the leader's exile payoff as a question mark. And that's because it depends on whether we have universal jurisdiction and whether the leader is culpable. First, imagine that the leader is not culpable or there is no universal jurisdiction. So this is either pre-1998 or post-1998 with the leader not having committed any atrocities beforehand. In this case, I've made the exile payoff two. The leader gets to go into retirement and enjoy that Swiss bank account. Like any other interaction, to figure out what's going to happen here, we start at the end and work our way up. Here, that means looking at what the leader will do, supposing that the rebels choose to revolt. In that case, we have a payoff of two for the leader going into exile and a payoff of zero for the leader fighting. So the leader here prefers the sure bet of going into exile and enjoying his golden parachute, taking the risks that come along with fighting a war. Now we can take that piece of information and feed it into the rebels' decision. If the rebels choose to revolt, the leader will go into exile and the rebels will get a payoff of three. If the rebels choose to concede, they'll get a payoff of negative one. So clearly the rebels here are going to revolt because that allows them to get their best outcome possible. Note that this is exactly the sort of outcome that international organizations geared toward justice would want to have be implemented. The rebels are taking over the country. The leader, who is despotic, is being taken out of the country. This is a good outcome for the international community. Now let's reset the game and have the leader be culpable in a world with universal jurisdiction. So the leader has committed crimes against humanity, and we're after 1998. I've changed that exile payoff to being negative one. If the leader goes into exile, then they'll just be arrested. They won't get to enjoy their golden parachute. What happens now? Well, consistent with the logic that we've talked about before, the leader is going to prefer to fight here. Exile looks bad, and while it's possible that fighting will lead to a bad outcome as well for the leader, it's also possible that the leader will win. So fighting is better than the alternative. Feeding that piece of information into the rebels' decision, if the rebels revolt, the leader fights, and the rebels receive a payoff of negative two. If the rebels concede, they receive a payoff of negative one. So they suffer the consequences of the policy that they don't like, because fighting is a worse alternative. But notice that the outcome here is exactly the sort of thing that a justice-oriented institution would like to avoid. The leader gets to stay in power, and the rebels are willing to concede on the policy issue area because they don't have a better choice. And to make matters worse, it is universal jurisdiction that is what led to this. Universal jurisdiction has made exile look unattractive to the leader, which makes its commitment to fighting credible. And that commitment to fighting being credible is what deters the rebel group from engaging in the rebellion in the first place. 
and it gets even worse. Imagine that you're a leader who had no interest in committing any atrocities. Now, with universal jurisdiction, by committing an atrocity, you block off your path to exile. And that can look attractive to you because it makes your commitment to fighting credible, which again, in turn, convinces some rebel groups out there not to revolt. So because universal jurisdiction exists, you might now want to actually commit an atrocity. It's very perverse. The takeaway here is that the design of international institutions is difficult. Individuals on the ground do not follow the spirit of the rules. They follow the incentive structures that the rules create. And so while the intent behind the rule might be to get justice for crimes that have been committed and deter others from committing those crimes later on, that might not always be what ends up happening due to the incentive structures that have been created. I hope you enjoy this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.